controversy is deepening over large-scale mining of sea sand at Diani Ocean Waters for the ongoing construction at the port. Scientists are worried that Diani's award-winning beaches may be depleted by the activities. Our special projects editor Asha Mwilu probed these concerns and now reports. We're on special assignment in Kwale County. Hoteliers, environmentalists and locals are protesting sand harvesting activities on the beaches of Diani and Tiwi. Aerial images filmed by local organizations show what appears to be massive dumping of silt by the dredging vessels at sensitive coral reef areas. And pressure is now mounting against the Kenya Ports Authority. Save the animals. Save the reef. Save the reef. We are at the beaches of Diani and Tiwi to investigate the impact of these sand harvesting and dredging vessels to the marine life here. It's a beautiful day at Tiwi Beach in Kwale County. But these fishermen have little to be happy about. For the fifth day this week, most of them have returned from the waters empty-handed. Today's catch is five fish. The men will share this for lunch. They have nothing more to sell and not enough to take back home. They blame their woes on this vessel seen at a distance. The ship is hired by the Kenya Ports Authority and is harvesting sand for the ongoing construction of the second container terminal at the port. The fishermen claim that the dredging vessel has been operating very close to shore and is now threatening the health of the ocean. Uwa mchanga unapo tolewa pale chini, ukiletwa juu ya meli, ni kwamba uwa hino bari yote ni vumbi tupu. Vumbi ambalo ata yule mvumbi ambaya naenda kufuwa na, na kio, na, na hii tunaita uvumbi wa bunduki, haizi yona samaki. Na pia upande wa kwa utali, wale utali ambao napele kwa scuba diving, hawaoni kitu. Hawaoni samaki wale maridadi, hawaoni hizo corals, corals imefinikwa na michanga. If these concerns are true, then KPA has a case to answer. But we've decided to camp at Tiwi Beach and observe the vessel's operations for ourselves. On our first morning here, the vessel arrives by 8 a.m. It appears very close to the shore, only a few meters beyond the reef. The vessel remains in this one spot for the better part of the morning and before midday, it retreats back to the port. By 3 p.m., the vessel is back. It camps at the same spot all afternoon. At 5 p.m., it's still here. 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And by the time we stop filming at 10 p.m., the vessel's lights still shine bright in the horizon. This pattern is repeated over the next three days. It's day two, around 10.20 a.m. Guess who's back? 
We can't help but wonder what this high frequency of harvesting on one location is doing to the ocean. It's not even when it's collecting sand that's most important. It's afterwards, like a, an hour or two afterwards. Marine scientist Dan Obura has been documenting the effects of these sand harvesting activities. He and his team have monitored coral reefs, especially in zones where the vessel has been harvesting heavily. We saw that a huge amount of silts had been deposited in the reef. This was adjacent to the area where they had been harvesting the most intensively. And we could see that a lot of fine sand had been resuspended up into the water column. Uh, carried to the reef by the currents or the tides and then it was really embedded in the algae, the vegetation, the grass and so on that grows on the bottom. It was on some of the coral colonies and there was some stress to the corals. The silt that is suspended in the water from doing the sand harvesting activities can smother corals, can smother the algae, um, it gets in the way of fish for feeding, for their vision and communication and, and what they do. So it can kill a reef, it, it can definitely cause a huge amount of damage on the scale at which it's being done. When we asked the Kenya Ports Authority whether they were aware of these impacts, they introduced us to their Japanese contractor and to their environmental consultant to explain this process. This was once water, so you borrow sand at the deep sea, bring it here, fill, you displace the water until you get dry land. Then on the dry land now you do the paving, turning it into what we call a container bath and terminal. For the project we need uh, about 3 million cubic meters, 3 to 3.5 million cubic meters of sand. We have uh, at depths of minus 40 to minus 50, so there is no deliberate or even there is no chance of going near a coral reef. You will not get a uniform distance between the coral and the 40 meter line. So sometimes it is a bit clo close. But paramount is what is the impact if you're working very close to the coral. If you are working and you manage to mitigate any of your impacts, you can proceed. But if we feel that if you're working close to the coral and there is an impact, then you need to move away. We have uh, blocks, what we call the sand blocks. So if the e effects of sand harvesting are severe on one block, before they turn severe, you shift to another harvesting block to minimize on those impacts. For the past two days, KPA has kept the harvesting vessel away from Tiwi Beach in a bid to reduce any negative effects. At dawn, Mwatengeza and his colleagues prepare to go fishing. With the vessel out of sight, they hope today's catch will be bountiful. But it's not looking too positive. Mansoor, who is just returning from an early morning fishing expedition, comes bearing bad news. Despite being out since 4 a.m., he's only caught two squids. <laughs> Tiwi is known for its diverse coral colonies with a big fish population, perfect for snorkeling, deep sea diving, scuba diving, and most importantly, a crucial fishing site for local fishermen. Could the work of KPA's harvesting vessels have negatively affected the fishing zones at Tiwi? There's only one way to find out. With the help of two marine scientists, we conduct an independent dive to survey the reef at Tiwi. It's already looking grim from our glass boat. There are uh there are some impacts of the sand harvesting. You can see increased sedimentation in the algae around corals, uh, and some of the corals um, are stressed. They're showing signs of stress, There's some bleaching um, and some paling of corals. Uh, however, for the most part, we found that the coral reefs, are, uh, the corals, are still in a healthy state um, and have been able to cope with the stress. What about the concerns of fewer fish by the fishermen? You can't really make a judgment call on that since we don't have pre 
harvesting data. Right. Um, but there are definitely low levels of fish in the area. For the, for the quality of coral and diversity on the reefs, there should be more fish if there was less fishing or less harvesting, we don't, we don't know. When the fishermen go to the, to, in the morning to, to fish and come out with almost nothing, and at the same time there is a dredger harvesting sand, what the fishermen conclude? He conclude it's because of the dredger. Whether it's because of the dredger, whether it's because of climate change, whether it's because of anything else. The original license for the sand harvesting was issued by the National Environmental Management Authority in 2007 when the environmental impact assessment was performed. But when KPA requested to harvest more sand for its port expansion plans, NEMA simply added an addendum in 2012 and requested the contractor to observe any mitigation measures. What's difficult to grapple with is how a project of this magnitude was given the green light without having fully adhered to the law. The contractors of this project should have never been allowed to begin the sand harvesting and dredging without having conducted a proper and thorough environmental impact assessment. That's what's required under the Environmental Management and Coordination Act of 1999. In fact, this environmental impact assessment would have clearly brought out any potential threats to the environment and to the livelihoods of the locals. But now, with government agencies singing different tunes, one would wonder who exactly dropped the ball. Um, as part of the EIA process, they did identify two monitoring locations. But when I looked at the plans, it, it wasn't really done in an adequate way to really monitor the impacts of the activity in the right locations, the right depths, and so on. Um, the EIA was done at a point when the EIA law was quite young in the country. Uh, I think at the time it was a benchmark EIA. Um, could it be better? I think that can be said of any EIA because it's done by a body of experts that have a different opinion or from a different uh, group of experts. So you try and predict as many impacts as you can and for you to know if an EIA study has been successful during the implementation you, should, you shouldn't have too many emerging issues. So if we go based on the, the issues that are raised um, it could have been better. Some of those impacts might not happen today. It might take two, three, four years, five years to come. Then we say, wow, what happened? It's because of what we did four or five years ago. That's why it's very critical to do proper analysis. You know, from the beginning, uh, NEMA, NEMA was not very clear on, uh, on, on its justification for, for dredging. And I remember there was another meeting in 2014, 2015, where they were very, uh, you know, it was very surprising, you know, to hear NEMA saying, we will arrange, you know, in some of those areas to relocate fish. How do you relocate fish in the Indian Ocean? NEMA, who ought to have been closely monitoring the impacts of the harvesting and perhaps insist on a robust impact assessment from KPS contractor, was not available to comment on these concerns. But NEMA did issue an improvement order to KPA with five areas that they thought needed attention. The five areas were more of submission of data to NEMA. There were not anything to change the way we are operating. Um, so we have availed all those documents to NEMA and um, I think that was to their satisfaction. According to these specifications seen by Citizen Television, the Dutch-owned dredger hired by KPS contractors has the ability to dredge up to a depth of 62 meters, which means that they could probably go further into sea. When you go a kilometer, two or three kilometers offshore, the current speed increases a lot, the main oceanic current. The depth is much greater for anything that drops all the way to the bottom. Um, and, and it's that much further from the reef to prevent the spread of any silt that is, that is discharged coming to the reef system. For us to do that would be quite expensive. Uh, if we do it based on data, then we would be making the correct decision. If we do it based on, um, what can I say, social perception, it might not be um, the best decision. We have huge marine area, 2,000 200 plus nautical miles. There must be areas we can get these materials without necessarily impacting on other ecosystems and people. It is NEMA's responsibility 
to undertake the environmental impact assessment, uh, which also includes public participation in that matter. Uh, and as I said earlier, this uh, has not been shared if it has been conducted. Was there public participation before this project commenced? Yes, there was um, public participation. We've not had only one. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there have been numerous of them. Um, some of them prior to the commencement of the first phase and some of them during the construction of the first phase and uh, others during the construction of the second phase. Was there any public participation before the commencement of the second phase? Um, only for um, key stakeholders. Who are so these key stakeholders? The key stakeholders are the agencies that would um, be the front line of any grievance that would come uh, from the public themselves. So, but public participation means public? Public, public participation, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we did not um, do another public participation before the commencement of the second phase. Although we have now embarked on a uh, stakeholder program to make sure all stakeholders are, are aware. The AMPAS continues as locals demand the exit of KPA's vessels from their shores. Meanwhile, KPA is scrambling to compensate those complaining and the agencies mandated to monitor the effects of the dredging are turning a deaf ear. But the true picture of what this savage harvest could be doing to the ocean and the beaches of Kwale County remains a guessing game. Ashamwilu on special assignment for Citizen TV.